Hello, and welcome to Pass the Torque. I'm your host, Katie Condry. Each week, we delve into a different topic from ISS to robotics to this week's topic, on-orbit surfacing. We have with us today OSAM-1 robot subsystem lead, JoLynn Russell, and she's here to tell us all things surfacing. Don't forget, you can leave any of your questions in the comments below for a chance to have them answered by JoLynn later this week. Without further ado, I'll pass it to her. Can you tell us about yourself and your career? Hi, I'm JoLynn Russell. Um, I am currently the lead for the robotics group on the OSAM mission at NASA. Um, my career started actually in automotive. I'm a mechanical engineer and I spent seven years working at Ford and then transferred to aerospace and I've worked on uh, weather satellites and some um, smaller tech demo missions within the um, satellite servicing division. And now um, I'm working on the OSAM mission with a team of uh, brilliant engineers of software, mechanical, um, electrical, all working together to build um, a robot system for our upcoming mission. What do you do now? I'm currently the robot subsystem lead for the OSAM mission. So our group is a combination of mechanical engineers and electrical engineers that are working on building a space robot. We also have a bunch of software engineers and controls engineers trying to figure out how to program that to make it work in space. And then we have a whole um, group of people testing that robot and developing the approach that will test the robot on the ground and that it'll still to the best that we can to represent what it's going to be like to um, perform in space. So that's kind of one of the interesting things for us to figure out is how to have things work in 1G um, and actually support themselves and do all the tasks that we need here on Earth to prove that we can work, make the system work that will eventually work where there's um, no gravity and things are a little in a different environment of thermal and vacuum. What is on-orbit servicing and why is it important? So on-orbit servicing is kind of the next phase of how we can um, do a lot more things in space. So to date, whenever we've tried to have to fix something or um, make updates like we did for Hubble, all that work was done with astronauts. Um, and a lot of the work that we do on space station is um, done with astronauts, and there's some robotics there as well. But as we go further away um, and try to get to Mars and back to the moon and all of those kind of um, scenarios, we need to be able to do this work uh, remotely with people on the ground and have the robots perform these operations in space for us um, to help us explore the next the next frontiers. We have a whole team um, putting together the actual operations and figuring out um, the path and the way that we want the robots to act in space and a lot of those things when we're far away we need to be able to do autonomously as well. So we have a lot of sensors in the system that make sure we know where it's positioned. Um, there's force sensors that let us know when we're into contact with things and to make sure we don't push too hard. We have a whole um, team of people working on uh, tool drive and tools and specialty items that will be able to do these activities remotely. Um, and there's a delay, of course, so we can't, um, everything isn't instantaneously. So everything's slow and we have to work through very detailed processes and make sure um, we can anticipate things uh, before they happen and have procedures in place to fix things that go amok. What did surfacing look like in the past? So in the past, we would send astronauts out to make some repairs like we did on Hubble, but in a lot of cases, we actually didn't service things. So if a satellite that was in orbit, one of something went wrong with one of its instruments or something needed repair, there wasn't really a way to do it, and we'd actually just decommission those satellites. So the goal going forward is to have an option to fix something that's minor, um, repair things, uh, maybe add extra functionality that we learn later, and so that's missions like this will give us that capability um, to hopefully use uh, assets, both commercial and government, longer. We have the technology. I think we've gotten a lot smarter in how we can implement these kind of control systems and these robotic systems. We've seen them working on the space station, on Mars, and I think that these options are now available to us. I think also we're starting to get a lot more things in space and a lot more space junk, and the more things that we can keep working longer um, will benefit everybody. In what ways are we taking what we learned from the Hubble servicing missions and applying it now? Yeah, so from Hubble, we developed a ton of tools. Um, we'd get the feedback of the astronauts in those cases, um, and so that helped us develop a, a way to test, evaluate, um, and kind of inspire the 
the actual tools that we need for these kind of missions. And now we are taking that and trying to have that be able to be done robotically, um, probably safer and um, in a lot more different locations. How will servicing look different in the future? What are some future applications? So I think our goal is um, this mission is being done in an uncooperative environment where the satellite that we're going to go service on OSAM wasn't planned for servicing. And going forward, we're trying to implement features on satellites and um, different aspects that we would be able to track satellites better and make this a quicker, faster process with a lot more knowns, and it would give us more capability on the satellite that we're flying. So as we go forward, as the industry moves towards acknowledging that servicing is the way of the future, we're hoping that we can refuel more satellites in a quicker way um, than what we're doing on this particular mission as we prove out all these technologies. So OSAM is focused on low Earth orbit. Um, as we go forward, we're looking at expanding the whole servicing and refueling realm um, into deeper into space, into further destinations that allow us to do a lot more exploration going forward. So I think we're proving out these technologies here in low Earth orbit where some of the delays aren't quite as, as big and where we know we have an asset that we can um, go and perform this mission on. But going forward, as we expand into the outer reaches of the of the solar system, we have a lot more options. How can astronauts and robots work together in on-orbit servicing? So robots can complement the work that astronauts do and can let them take actions and perform tasks that would be complicated and dangerous for them on their own. So I think together we can really press exploration and move forward in a lot of NASA's missions. So when astronauts are doing tasks in orbit, they have their spacesuits, their, their hand dexterity can be limited, and so I think we can extend their cap capability with specialized tools and robots and fit into spaces, um, go into different hazardous environments, and take on some tasks that we wouldn't want to put an astronaut in the way of. So interestingly enough, when we are servicing arm is uh, seven degrees of freedom. And when you look at it, we actually title it with a, a shoulder, an elbow, and a wrist. So we have all those different joints. And so we that's actually how we name it. And we kind of follow how you would do things with your arm. Tell us about what the S in OSAM 1 will entail. OK, so the S in OSAM is for servicing. And so what we're going to end up doing on this mission is we've got a bunch of sensors. And we're going to uh, autonomously find and capture the Landsat 7 satellite. We'll grab it and then we will berth it into three different berthing posts and get it situated. And then we will clamp it into place. We'll then take the robot arm and we will go find the tools that we need that are placed strategically um, on the payload deck. And so we will go through some steps to open up the blankets, pull back the blanketing that's on there that's protecting the satellite uh, thermally. And then we will find the, the valve that the fuel was put in initially, remove the cap, place that aside, and then bring forth the fuel and refuel the satellite and leave a cap behind. And then go through kind of the reverse where we let the Landsat 7 go and have it go back on its way and extend its life. What's the next big step for OSAM-1? So we're kind of at an exciting point in time in the OSAM project. We've been doing a lot of the design work and we have some prototypes and engineering development units that we've been working with to try to make sure that the plan we have for this mission is viable. And so we just passed a key decision point C where NASA headquarters gave us the approval to go ahead with this mission. And so now we're going out and we're making the actual flight hardware and building up the, the payload deck, and we'll start testing that through several different scenarios, including thermal vacuum, uh, vibration testing, kind of the exciting part where we really prove out that all of this hardware is ready for launch and for space. And so it's, a, it's an exciting time to come out of the paper design and into the implementation stage. Our team is actually split up across the country. So the robot arm itself is being built out at a facility in uh, California, and then it'll ship here and get integrated um, with a lot of the other pieces of what we call the payload. So there's a lot of, as you can imagine, it's kind of like a big puzzle. There's a lot of things that have to come together to make this work. So there's electronics boxes, uh, power supply units, we've got a bunch of the tools, and then the actual structure 
Um, so the majority of that's built here at Goddard, and then the robot arms will come from California and we'll integrate a bunch of these systems together um, and see how it all comes together. It's very exciting. It's my favorite part of the whole mission. What are you most looking forward to at Nexus and at NASA? So going forward, it's always exciting to see the mission come together, and there's nothing like the, the actual launch of your mission um, and getting getting to see something go from Earth to space and see its cape, you know, it kind of is tear jerking when you actually see something leave and uh, see what the next phase is, um, improve out these new technologies. I think it's really cool that we're working on something that will change uh, both commercial and space exploration going forward. I'm pretty new to robotics, and so I was pretty fortunate to get um, selected to work with this team. And I think just every day I learn something new about um, what people actually know. It's really cool to see such a talented group uh, come together. Day in and day out, the thing that is always exciting to come to is actually to see the hardware come together, to see the people figure out how to make things work um, that seemed infeasible even a couple weeks before. Um, it's, it's a really exciting place to work and I'm fortunate to be surrounded by a really great team um, that's way smarter than me. <laughs> so it's fun. What do you like to do for fun? Well, you saw my crazy kids. <laughs> um, so we like to get out, adventure, bike, uh, travel. Um, they're, really, they're really great at exploring the world. So we kind of like to go do that together. Lots of hiking, lots of running. Um, yeah, just checking out what's out there. I think that's kind of the theme of our, of our household for sure. Thanks so much, Dylan. And now it's your turn to ask a question. Go ahead and drop a question in the comments below for a chance to have it answered by Jolene later this week. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. So this is my new home office. I've got this crew here of kiddos. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah, okay. and now every day is take your child to work day. Oh. This one is? Sidon. Hey, when Hi, I'm Keen. <laughs> so what are you guys going to be when you grow up? I will be just a parent um, <laughs> helping out my kids. You're just going to help out some kids? What are you going to do, Phelan? Nothing! <laughs> I'm gonna, I want to be a biologist. So this I is our crew. Yeah, we've been reading some science books on the front porch office here and uh, building a lot of Legos. What else have you guys been doing in quarantine? Um, we did a little snap circuits, right? Some snap circuits, yeah. So oh, yeah, I also want to be an electrical engineer. So maybe we got some future engineers here as well. We'll see.